Director, first of all, thanks very much for giving us the time. I mean, you're a busy day, and you don't often have film crews in here. But secrecy has been so much a part of CSIS from the beginning. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little about how you see the job, how you see the role of CSIS, and, and really some of the misconceptions that are out there. I think the main thing to remember is that CSIS is an organization that gathers information. I mean, we do this through a variety of means, mostly through talking to people. So we try and gather information to inform governments so that they can take better policy decisions. We also use some covert ways of doing it. But essentially, we, both in Canada and abroad, we seek to find out what's going on in respect to threats to the security of Canada. And these days, the main threat, I think, is counterterrorism. When the service was created 25 years ago, it was mostly counterespionage. We also worry about things like uh, weapons of mass destruction, foreign interference, which is increasing, and a variety of more specific files. But mostly, we're out there to try and find out what's going on. Give us a sense, though, of your day as a director. You have to inform the government of Canada of threats on a daily basis, presumably. I mean, how does that happen? Can you give us a little bit of a sense of the atmosphere? Do you talk to the Prime Minister? How does it run, that part of your job of informing people? Well, I think it's done in a variety of ways, and I guess I'd, I'd create two modules. One is the longer-term strategic stuff. You know, we have a lot of people here. There are a lot of other people in, in the government of Canada. We get together. We talk about things. And that's like in any other business. You develop procedures and you do things. And in that respect, most of the consultation and most of the information is conveyed on paper. You know, we have a series of papers that we pass on to government. If there's a particular incident, you know, or, or a crisis or emergency, uh, we usually set up some sort of ad hoc arrangement. Depending upon who's involved, it may be only us or five or six departments. We create little task forces, and we try and draw in on information throughout the system and from our allies around the world. Uh, if it's very, very urgent, you know, we might call the National Security Advisor. We m I might talk to my minister. But because of the sensitivity of a lot of this stuff, we try and put it on paper. I mean, it's important to get things right. So to a considerable degree, our lives are meetings and reading. But what about, say, at the very top in Canada? You, you, you're concerned about an issue, for instance. You think it should be taken not just to the minister, but, say, to the prime minister. How does that relationship work in terms of briefing a prime minister of Canada? Well, we do it in, in two ways in Canada. One, the minister can talk to the prime minister, and depending upon the minister and depending upon the issue, that sometimes happens. By and large, though, I think most of our information is conveyed through the National Security Advisor. You'll probably know that one of the big issues in this community is coordination. Uh, so the, uh, the government has created the National Security Advisor to the Prime Minister, whose main role is to act as a funnel from the community to the Prime Minister. So I'd say in most circumstances, uh, we would pass information on to her, and she would convey it to the Prime Minister. Is this the norm now in Western intelligence agencies? Uh, or I'm almost asking, is it a good idea that uh, it gets final rather than a direct director to Prime Minister approach? I think it depends a lot on the, on the country. I mean, if you take the United States as an example, they're in a unique situation. I mean, I think the director of the CIA or one of his agents talks to the president quite regularly. But they have a range of interests and preoccupations that I think no other country has. I think in the UK, it's probably somewhere between here and the United States. Fundamentally, I think the bottom line is we've got to do something that works for a particular prime minister. Uh, our current prime minister, I think, uh, prefers finding out about things for on paper. And then if he's interested, he asks for meetings. You, we will be seeing you today in a couple meetings. I mean, you mentioned earlier that your day's meetings and a lot of readings. Could you, could you describe the kind of meetings you would have on an ordinary day here? What would you be looking for? What would you be doing? Well, I think there are two or three kinds of meetings. I mean, this place is like any other. It's even like the CBC. We've got financial issues. We've got HR issues. So we talk about management issues. Uh, we talk about longer range issues. You know, we're planning, are we going to do an intelligence assessment, for example, on what's happening in Yemen, which is a part of the world that we're really concerned about? So it would be a question of bringing together people on the operational side who might know about what's going on. We'll plan uh, new operations to try and find out information. Again, on the third module would be uh, something that's of interdepartmental interest. So we would get together, uh, usually under the chairmanship of the NSA, all representatives from the community, and we'll either work through policy issues uh, or we'll go through and talk about assessment issues, uh, an evaluation of Somalia or something of that nature. How about when you have big, big events on the horizon, the Olympics, the G20, G 
geez, this, geez, that. <laughs> uh, the, 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 you know, governments that are coming here to Canada. I mean, how big a load does that put on you, and how closely do the meetings have to follow that? I think pretty closely. I mean, these things have really become a whole of government issue. No one department handles this anymore. On the security side, it's the Mounties who have to bear the brunt of it. But we, for example, on the Olympics, started working on uh, our kind of work a year, year and a half before. It's a matter of going out and trying to find out, is anybody interested in doing anything bad in respect of the Olympics? Uh, I think one of the things that's often forgotten about our service, we can't sort of wake up one morning and say, we're interested in subject X, tell me about it. We have to develop sources, we have to use electronic means of acquiring information, and all of this takes time. So in, in the context of the Olympics, we would have tried to develop sources, uh, we would have talked to our allies around the world, we'd share this information with the Canada Border Services Agency, with the RCMP, and this would involve meetings at all levels. And in fact, in respect of the Olympics, the Prime Minister had appointed a uh, national coordinator for security, and we would do most of our work through him. CIS has, has such a huge responsibility. We mentioned you have to be careful. Things can go very wrong. And I mean, I want to ask, in a way, as a director, what worries you? What, what is the kind of thing that has you coming in here every day, really wondering what you're going to find in the file, and quite worried about how you're handling it? Mm. Again, two answers to that. There are specific files. Uh, you know, we have... Uh, I think an increasing worry in this country about domestic radicalization. You know, young people who all of a sudden, for a variety of reasons, uh, want to do jihad, who want to develop the capacity to do harm to others, either here or abroad. So we worry a lot about those. I guess that's really a subset of a broader problem. I worry about what I don't know. I mean, what our job is to acquire information. So if we have a grip on a particular person or file, there may be issues with it, but uh, what I really worry about is, is there a terrorist cell somewhere in Canada that we don't know about? Do the Mounties know about this cell or not? So really, we spend a lot of time trying to select the right areas, the right topics, the right people uh, to develop an interest in. And, you know, we try and do this within the context of our, our statute, which requires us to have a reasonable, reasonable suspicion that something wrong is, is about to happen. So fundamentally, it's um, what do we not know? But what about cases even where you are following? The surveillance is there. Uh, how much of a ongoing tension is the whole concept? When do we act? Are we waiting too long? Are we taking more risks than we should on this? That's an excellent question, and I think each case is dealt with separately. But if you take, for example, the, uh, the Toronto 18, uh, some of whom have pleaded guilty and a number of whom are being dealt with by the criminal courts, I mean, we followed them for quite a while. Uh, we then passed the file over to the RCMP. The RCMP followed them with us in a parallel series of investigations or inquiries. And then at some point, it really is their call. We're going you know, to bring in the Crown and we're going to prosecute. The areas where it's really most difficult is we're in the course of an inquiry and all of a sudden people go from just talking about doing something to it appears they may have acquired some explosives. And... Um, a lot of it is talk. I mean, and that's one of the real problems we have. Our job is not to interfere with people's lives when they're just a bunch of, you know, bunch of guys over a cup of coffee or beer talking big, but to try and really determine when something might go wrong. And when that happens and we think something is going to go wrong, I mean, we bring in as many people as we can. We talk about it. It's not an easy decision. Uh, and if we think something is going to go wrong in the very short term, we'll call in first responders and they'll, uh, they'll intervene. And you also have the uh, added complexity of dealing with other governments who may have a different take of how severe the, the threat is. I mean, uh, how much is that a, a kind of concern here that, well, we're being asked to look at this group pretty carefully by such and such governments, the British say. Uh, you, you know, we don't want it blowing up in our faces. We don't want it blowing up in the British face. There's a lot of pressure there. That's true. I think, that, you know, the... the um the even better example, if I can put it that way, is, is our relationship with the United States. I mean, we share a continent. We worry, honestly, about what is going on in their country, and uh, they worry about what's going on here. We both like to think that we have an effective grip on threats to security in each of our countries. But, you know, if something is going on in Toronto with a bomb or something, it's not very far from the United States. So we make a conscious effort to make sure that they're informed and we believe that when they have issues in their country that might affect us they do the same and you know I think 
the United States has cause to be more worried than we have about a number of these threats, so they tend to worry a little bit more about it. Um, so in cases dealing with uh, individuals who might have an impact on U.S. security, we try very hard to make sure that A, they're informed, and B, that we don't let them go off on a tangent where we might lose control. It's very, very important for Canada to keep the American comfort level up when it comes to that border. Because again, here, the, what one doesn't know are the stakes involved. And uh, say an incident happening in Canada may not just directly affect Canada, but indeed cause uh, bad repercussions in the States. I think that's absolutely right. And, uh, you know, I can't help but go back to 9 11. There are still a lot of Americans who think that those who perpetrated the attacks on 9 11 came from Canada, which is absolutely and totally incorrect. So not only do we have to deal with the realities of the kind of thing you're talking about, we have to deal with the perception of the reality. So we, we think we have a very good relationship with the, the Central Intelligence Agency and the FBI, as does the RCMP. So, but it is a daily and a weekly uh, grind to make sure that we share the information, that we understand, they understand what we're up to and we understand what they're up to. Let's break it down into what your, your biggest concerns that you have to deal with all the time. And I think I, and every Canadian would say, surely it's uh, counterterrorism. Um, tell us about how that's changed, for instance, uh, over the last decade and what it means to you now. Well, I think fundamentally the biggest change is 10 or 15 years ago, it wasn't a big problem. I mean, uh, before 9-11, absolutely there were concerns about terrorism, but the world fundamentally changed. Um, when the service was first created 25-odd years ago, we worried about espionage. We barely had any concerns about terrorism. We spend something of the order of 40 to 45 percent of our budget on counterterrorism. That's a massive, massive effort. It's becoming more complicated as well because up until quite recently, uh, most of the terrorist threats truly originated abroad. You know, to be honest, a lot of them came out of the Afghanistan-Pakistan area. Uh, people over there you know, generated plots and they directed them towards the West. The real change over the course of the last couple of years has been the growth of domestic radicalization. We have a lot of people whose families have been here second or third generation. They still have attachments back to home. For some reason or other, they don't quite connect as entirely with Canadian society as we would all hope. Uh, I think one of our biggest worries and the biggest change is the use of the Internet. I mean, most of the cases that we deal with respecting domestic radicalization, it's because somebody's got on the Internet and they've become attached, attracted to jihad sites originating from the Middle East. Some of these are appallingly violent, but they attract a certain kind of person. And we have to spend a great deal of time, money, and effort trying to figure out, again, as I was saying, not just those who are disenchanted or unhappy, but somebody who's really likely to do something, the Toronto 18 being a case in point. So the real difference now is there are people in Canada uh, that we worry about from a terrorism perspective. And the really bad news is, is that the Brits, the Americans, and the Australians are going through the same thing. So it's not a uniquely Canadian uh, phenomenon. It's one that we're sharing with our close allies. I remember a few years back, in fact, it was, it was somewhat taken as a bit of a, a brag by Canada that we didn't share the same problems with the British and the French. We didn't have homegrown terrorists. That all changed. Uh, Absolutely. How do you explain the psychology of it? Is there a, is there a clear idea inside CSIS that how this happens? No. And, you know, to be quite honest, if I had that answer, I'd be a very rich consultant. A lot of people are spending a lot of time, money, and effort here in the U.K. and the U.S. You know, we can, we, we can disengage individual cases. Um, there seems to be a, you know, there's an age group, young men, 18 to 25, uh, who for one reason or other are, don't seem to integrate socially. They, they meet a bunch of other people. They connect on the Internet. And sometimes that's all that happens. It's like you or I might have gotten together and had a beer when we were young. They get together and have a cup of coffee and talk about things. But in a few limited cases, there's something, there's a disconnect that drives them towards violence. Uh, we have real cases of people who've left Canada and have gone to Somalia, Yemen, or, uh, or the AFPAC area to train to do jihad. Uh, it's also worrisome because initially they went over there and the intent was they would fight there. But we, were, we, along with our allies, are now discovering a few cases where they're being directed to plan to come back to Canada to do violence. 
That's the biggest change, I think, over the last couple of years. One of the things uh, that is striking if you compare 30, 40 years ago to today, and that is there seem to be so many more target, potential targets today mm -hmm. that could really cripple or hurt a modern society. Uh, what, how much of a worry is that? I think it's true. I think the biggest concern is the entire world is run by computers. Uh, you know, you can't get up in the morning without some computer doing something for you. Uh, you know, we've always had to worry about the electrical grid and nuclear facilities, and they, they remain a concern. But uh, cyber terrorism, you know, which is a word that you hear more and more, I think is a, is a reality. There are a couple of countries that really uh, try and attack our systems on a daily basis. The United States uh, considers that it's now potentially a form of warfare. I mean, if you can close down a society's computers, you've basically won. You can't fly. Uh, the food system goes to, uh, to pieces and a whole bunch of other things occur. So I think the real worry for us is really cyber terrorism uh, while maintaining a concern about all the others that I talked about. You mean, uh, to get the mm -hmm. last one. Thanks. I mean, cyber terrorism could be at a stage now where it's actually more worrisome than, say, uh, an explosion in part of the grid of our infrastructure. I, I don't know if I'd say that because yeah. with an explosion, you actually people are actually harmed, and I think you always have to worry when there's real harm to human beings. But and this is hypothetical. But if you develop a capacity somewhere else to uh, control, say, a third of North America's electrical grid, the amount of harm that you can do, not just economically but more generally, is not inconsiderable. Leaving aside the capacity when it can be developed to access our computers and to, you know, to exfiltrate information. I mean, that used to be the job of old-fashioned spies, but today you can do it by computers. To many Canadians, that, that we've dealt a bit with terrorism now, to many Canadians the days of espionage are over, and people wonder whether you even worry about it that much anymore. I know you have a somewhat sobering take on that. Yeah, it was one of the surprises that... Uh, I got when I came to CSIS about a year ago, I thought, I think like most Canadians, you know, sure there was some espionage, but I thought with the fall of the Berlin Wall and, you know, and whatnot, it had gone away. In fact, in Canada today, the level of, terror, of uh, espionage is roughly the same as it was during the Cold War. And in a couple of cases, it's worse than it was. And I've talked to my colleagues in uh, the UK, and they've noticed the same thing. There was a real drop after the fall of the Soviet Union, but now we're back to where we were again. I think the other thing that's important that I find interesting, Canadians tend to think, well, why would anybody want to spy on us? But I think we forget that technologically and scientifically we're one of the most advanced nations in the world, and countries can save billions by avoiding the R&D, the research and development. We're also a member of a large number of military and political alliances. So there's a lot to be had here. And in fact, I'm beginning to worry that we may not be spending quite enough effort on counter-espionage the difficulty that I have, as does everybody, is you have to balance where you allocate resources. But it most definitely is a serious problem. And if I had to guess, I'd say it's going to get worse. I've heard of staggering sums almost on the amount of money that Canada could lose in a given year uh, just because of theft. Mm -hmm. I mean, the espionage, theft of uh, our, our best secrets. I think that's right. I mean, it's very easy to, uh, you know, pick the, uh, the optics industry, uh, large chunks of the electronic industry, uh, the informatics industry, if you can leap ahead, you know, a generation or two of development without having to do the research and development yourself, uh, you save a fortune. And then if you can actually start marketing this stuff, you can make a mint again. So it's not hard to imagine why people do this. And not hard to imagine the cost to Canada if it keeps losing out. Absolutely. Because somebody's beating us through nefarious means. Absolutely. Uh, countries that are most active? I'm sure you're going to name them. <laughs> well, it's sort of hard for me to do that, and I don't think it takes a great deal of imagination. To, uh, but, you know, if you look at some of the, uh, the media stories over the course of the last couple of, uh, couple of weeks, you'll have a pretty clear indication there. I mean, we have a number of, uh, I'll call them old friends, who are still in the business. And then there are a few others. I mean, one area that's of particular concern is the research for material used in weapons of mass destruction. You know, the, the North Koreas of the world are trying very hard to acquire the material they need to, uh, to acquire nuclear weapons, as is the case with Iran. So just those two, for the purposes that they want to acquire technology, I think is very worrisome. And then you have the more general stuff that we talked about a minute ago. There used to be more talk in the old days of something like counter-subversion or mm -hmm. infiltration. 
How much of a problem or a concern here is the, the fact that foreign countries might be trying to infiltrate our, our basic system of government, which is kind of hard for Canadians mm. to get their head around? Yeah, we now call it foreign interference. I don't quite know when the terminology changed, but it's called foreign interference. Um, this is another area where I, was, I, I knew it existed, but I was a bit surprised about the extent to which uh, it is occurring. A number of countries take the view that if they can develop influence with people relatively early in their careers, they'll follow them through. Uh, and all of a sudden, they're a politician or they're a public servant who exercises some influence, and uh, they can really have an impact. Um, there are also no, a couple of countries that use the universities. There are, you know, there are social clubs, uh, you know, related to particular uni uh, particular countries. And before you know it, uh, a country is providing them with money. There's some sort of covert guidance. Uh, we're in fact a bit worried in a couple of uh, provinces that we have an indication that there are some uh, political uh, political p figures who have developed quite an attachment to foreign countries. I think it's the kind of thing that. If you're, the country, if you're a country that has uh, a lot of patience, this can really pay off, and there are a few who are like that. It's uh, like the old espionage world, putting sleepers in, uh, but this could concern uh, all levels of government. Right? No, absolutely, and, you know, I mean, I don't think it's difficult to imagine. You know, you get somebody of the same sort of ethnic background as you are. There's an affinity to begin with. You're usually a, not a, a long-standing Canadian. Usually it's somebody who's second, third generation becoming involved in public life or actually private sector sometime. So there's the, the old country connection. Uh, so you start uh, developing a relationship. Uh, you offer a trip back to the homeland. And before you know it, you're being asked to think about things in a slightly different way. That's not in and of itself terribly worrisome, but if, but if the individual becomes uh, in a position to make decisions that, is, that affect the country or the province or a municipality, all of a sudden decisions aren't taken on the basis of the public good, but on the basis of another country's preoccupations. So we do worry about that. He's not an agent of influence in a way. In a manner of speaking, yes. Mm -hmm. You can't name the countries. I would rather not. Yeah, right. Um, there is the other element to uh, foreign countries interfering with elements of the diaspora in Canada mm -hmm. that, in effect, you have to protect. Could you explain that problem where th th they really can make life hell for Canadians who are living here? No, I think that's true. There are a couple of groups that, uh, where the governments of their home country take the view that wherever they are in the world, they are still of concern to them. And either by sending people here or by using their embassies, they try and exercise some measure of control over those communities. In some cases, they ask for donations for political groups or whatnot. Uh, a couple of the countries don't like people to misbehave abroad, so they actually monitor their behavior. Um, and I don't think it's hard to imagine there are some countries, for example, in the Middle East, where behavior is quite rigidly controlled. People come here, they're expected to behave in the same manner. So. Representatives of those countries, you know, will sometimes just grab people by the scruff of the neck and send them back home so they can't continue their studies. We think that's a real interference with our sovereignty. So we try and monitor this and stop it when we can. I want to jump because we are talking about external factors and the influence in Canada and the risks from abroad to go right to that debate that's been going on almost since the beginning of CSIS. And that is, uh, CSIS does some work outside of Canada and it's empowered to. But some Canadians say that is not enough, that the country really does need an aggressive foreign intelligence service, perhaps CSIS based. And I, I think this is an important debate in Canada. I just wonder what your take on it is. Well, I think to begin with, it's as the Americans say, it's above my pay grade. I mean, it's not a decision that I'm going to make. But uh, fundamentally, I think we do a lot of what a foreign, foreign intelligence agency we do. If there's any connection at all with national security, we can deal with it abroad. So what's left? It's the, you know, the intentions and the capabilities of other countries insofar as they do not relate to national security. So the question I would ask is, okay, we set up a foreign intelligence service. Against whom are we going to direct them to spy? I think that's important because we, we're not going to spy against our close allies. Uh, there are a large number of countries that we're not interested in, period. So we're left with a relatively small group where we want general information as opposed to security. So my inclination, and I really want to stress I'm talking personally, is that the, the, the cost of operating a foreign intelligence service is much more than operating a domestic service. So the immense cost, the training, the development of relationships, 
The government may someday decide to do it, but to my mind, there isn't a really, really compelling case today. But so countries like Australia and Holland have decided to focus. They can focus mm -hmm. on specific areas of the world uh, of key concern to them. And it wouldn't be hard to construct uh, significant parts of focus for Canada and Southeast Asia, South Asia rather, Africa, areas where we feel our national interests are at stake. An operation like that surely could be run. No, I think it could be. I'm, I don't mean to suggest it could not be. I'm just suggesting that it's an expensive proposition. I mean, operating an agent, one of my officers in Canada, you know, on a yearly basis is, a, you know, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars. An agent operating virtually anywhere abroad is a million dollars a year. You know, you know, you can take the figures from foreign affairs. That's roughly what it costs them if you average everything else. So you start from the premise it's a very expensive proposition. If the government decides it wants to do it, it can be done. It would take, I think, some number of years before an agency like that could be up and running. Um, could absolutely be done. We could absolutely find countries against whom we would want to spy. All I'm arguing is it's the sort of decision, well, you imply, we've been thinking about it for 20 years. It's the sort of thing you have to think hard about before you create the agency. What about Afghanistan? CISIS has been active in Afghanistan. Can you give us some details of mm -hmm. the, the effort CISIS has done there? Right there? Our role there has varied over time. In 2002, uh, we were initially embedded with the military, and our sole preoccupation was to try and pro provide force protection to acquire information that the military might be able to use to avoid being attacked. As uh, Canada's presence there grew, uh, we, we developed our own station and substation, and we continued to be preoccupied with force protection. I mean, our, we really tried to the extent that we can assist the Canadian forces. And there are some examples where we were instrumental in avoiding some pretty bad, uh, emerge, um, pretty bad um, attacks on the military. But we've also moved into an area of general threats to national security. As you know, increasingly there are Canadians who leave Canada and go abroad to try and get trained and to participate in jihad. One of the things we try and do to the extent we can is to get a grip on Canadians who are abroad. There are a number in Afghanistan, so we do that. The other thing that we do is we try and acquire as much information as we can generally on you know, national stability and whatnot to support the ambassador and the embassy. I, because we're, that's one controversial area we talked about, but I want to jump to one that perhaps is more relevant today. This organization has changed enormously in the 25 years since it started, mm -hmm. and it's gone from Canadians saying don't keep any records on us to something quite different. What is it that really worries you about some of the changes now going on in your mandate and in the way you're expected to, to, to fulfill your function? I think there are two main ones, maybe three. The first one is the one that we've alluded to, and that's the increased preoccupation with what's going on abroad. There are very, very few threats to national security here that don't have a connection abroad. I think when CSIS was created, it, would, it was acknowledged that was the case. Uh, but we really didn't start doing this in a material way since around 9-11. So operating abroad, it's a, it requires a different mindset, it, it requires different relationships, it requires different uh, training. So that's one. It's quite significant operations abroad, which if the world continues to evolve the way it has been, we're probably going to have to do more of. Uh, the other is the change in the legal environment. I mean, you're quite right. When CSIS was created, uh, the objective was to figure out what was going on, keep what was relevant, and destroy everything else in order to protect the, the, the uh, privacy of Canadians. Today the courts have told us that if we have any information at all that could potentially be used in any judicial or quasi-judicial system, we have to keep the information. It, is, it, it appears simple uh, uh, at one level. You simply develop the capacity, you develop a computer, and you put, you put the information in it. But for our officers who are out there in the field, Everything they do now has to be documented. It, it has to be put into a, an informatic system, and it has to be retrievable. All of these are not insignificant information management problems, and if you multiply that over a couple thousand people, people who are working on in, the, in the service, it makes for a great deal of difference. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to see how it's going to evolve. I mean, if you have to keep appearing in courts and that. Mm -hmm. Do you think this should be discussed at a, a certain level in Canada so Canadians are at least clear how this change is taking place and what the ramifications are? Yes, I absolutely do, and I think we have to find a way of doing it when we're not responding to a crisis. I mean, one of the areas that uh, I find difficult to deal with in security intelligence is that we move forward or we have discussions in response to something that's gone wrong. I mean, there have been 
three or four royal commissions or commissions of inquiry over the course of the last little while, and they've clearly moved the marker. You know, we're doing things differently, other organizations are, and I think we're better for it. But you, you think about things differently when you're dealing with a crisis, and I think what's missing for us is an opportunity, a locale, a, a means of talking about what we do and why we do it in the absence of a crisis. Um, you know, there are a whole bunch of things that we could usefully talk about. Having said that, I think the CSIS Act has stood the test of time relatively well. It's a secret of organization still. You do still, I mean, you're the only face of CSIS we can actually photograph. Mm. But it, it, I'd like you, first of all, to sort of, in a sense, justify the, se the secrecy, but also deal with what it means to be a secret organization in a democratic country, where secrecy itself must bring up a, a degree of paranoia in some people and doubts on others. I think there's some truth in what you say. I mean, in Canada, we're very, very keen on transparency in government and accountability. And uh, I think it's fair to say that the way uh, CSIS was created, there's a fair bit of accountability. Um, but a lot of it takes place uh, on a trust basis. You know, Parliament created the Security Intelligence Review Committee, which has access to everything we do, um, but their work isn't made public. I think there's a distinction to be made. Um, what we do, and in particular why we do things, I think we could probably talk about rather more than we do. How we do things is an entirely different issue. I mean, the last thing I want is for people to know about our trade craft, to know about how we acquire sources, and to know about our relationships and how we get uh, intelligence from abroad. But it seems to me that in a democracy, it makes a lot of sense that people should understand why we have these worries and what we're trying to do about them. But it's hard to do this when the only time we talk about security, not the only time, most of the time that we talk about security and intelligence is because something is going wrong. So I, uh, you know, again, this is above my pay grade. I'm a public servant. I can't participate in much of this dialogue. But I think it would be good for the country if we would found some way of talking about it when people could be calm about what we do as opposed to uh, there's an issue where we need to have a commission of inquiry. Secrecy, though, also has a certain um, mystique about it that maybe intelligence services also mm. require. It, with information that you said goes power, well, in some government organizations with secrecy goes power. I mean, that would possibly be something CSIS wouldn't want to give up too much. I think if you're going to be a security agency, you have to have an element of what you do in secret. I mean, the people that we're trying to find out about spend a great deal of time, money, and effort maintaining secrecy around their activities. Spies and terrorists do not want people to know what they're doing. And uh, if anybody in this country thinks that we're exempt from that rule because we're Canadian, they're wrong. So we need to be able to operate in secret. We need to be able to ensure our sources, for example, that we're going to maintain uh, the promises that we've made to them, that they won't be, uh, they won't be revealed. In practical terms, this is a real problem because in many cases they're engaged in unlawful activities. And one, not the only, one of the objectives of what we do is to try and uh, transfer files to the RCMP for prosecution. So we have intelligence and we want to convert it into evidence. It can be done. I think in many cases it can be done even in a public trial. But in many instances we're using tradecraft, sources, or information from abroad that we absolutely have to protect. It's an issue where I think we're going to have to do some more work. It is working, though. The Toronto 18 prosecutions are an example. Well, you see, it's almost heresy for my generation who so covered McDonald Commission inquiry, saw it set up. I was led to believe that, well, most people want an intelligence service. Don't keep records. We don't want you keeping <laughs> thousands of records on Canadians. Get rid of them. And then you're not a prosecuting agency. You're not supposed to be out there making sure people are arrested. You're supposed to be out there making sure things don't happen. This is, gives you a kind of split personality in a way now, doesn't it? It's, you're, you're working against your original concept of what this intelligence agency should be doing. I agree with you. On the other hand, the environment is changing, the threat is changing, and quite clearly uh, the legal environment is changing. So we're, we're, we are adapting. I think that for the foreseeable future, we're going to have to come to grips with the fact that in many cases, not all cases, some of our intelligence is going to have to be used in criminal prosecutions. I think we have had more successes than we've had failures, but there have been a couple of instances where 
We've recommended and ministers have agreed that we've withdrawn intelligence from a trial because releasing the intelligence would cause greater harm to national security than a pros successful prosecution would yield. But I think bit by bit we're trying to resolve this issue. I don't have much more time, so I'm just going to throw out a few more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, Canadians who say, how do we know there's any oversight? I mean, CISA seems to go off in a world of its own. Politicians don't know much about it. They never ask good questions anyways. How do we know that CISA is actually under some kind of adult supervision? That's a good question. It's a fair question. But I, I'd remind us that the CISA Act, two-thirds of the CISA Act deals with our accountability and with our oversight. Parliament has created a committee of privy councillors. The Security Intelligence Review Committee has access to absolutely everything. It's created an inspector general that has access to absolutely everything. We're accountable to a parliamentary committee which deals with us. And I mean, people tend to, to forget that having a minister is not an academic exercise as well. Uh, every time I ask for a, a warrant uh, before the federal court to do some of the more intrusive things that we do, I have to convince my minister that this is a reasonable thing to do. Uh, so, yes, ministers are busy, uh, yes, they have a lot of things to do, but the way our world is structured, a lot of our highly intrusive work requires the consent of a minister. So I think we are, in fact, quite a bit uh, supervised, overseen, and that, in fact, it's impossible for us today to do a great deal without our, uh, our overseers knowing what we're doing. What about the uh, fear of some Canadians that it's a murky... Uh, awful world out there in many areas, and CSIS has to play with a lot of rough, tough customers, governments that do torture, governments that have pretty bad records of human rights, yet you're out there having to deal with these countries, these agencies. What's your attitude to that? I think it's true. We do. I think we have to be careful when we do, and I think we have to do it quite consciously. And if we're dealing with a government, for example, that has a poor human rights record, we have to factor that in. I mean, I don't think you have to be a, a, a rocket scientist to appreciate that if somebody acquires information by torturing someone, the information may well be incorrect. So we're always preoccupied about information being correct. So we caveat our information that we get from those kinds of countries. But I think this also has to be put into a broader context. You know, foreign affairs has relations with appalling countries. Uh, we have trade relations with countries that fall in the same category. There are parts of the world where intelligence services have more influence than foreign ministries. So it seems to me that in the end, as long as we, we, we circumscribe what we do and how we do it, it is in the national interest for us to be able to share information with these countries. A lot of Canadians might be surprised uh, at outreach, uh, CISA's outreach, going, just going out into communities, talking, mm -hmm. knocking on doors, saying, hi, we're from CISA. Uh, this would not have been so common 20 years ago. What, what's all this stuff going on? Well, it's true. I think we did a little bit of it back 25 years ago. We're trying to do a bit more. I think part of it is because, because of, the, of the way the world has evolved, our attention gets focused on a number of communities. Um, to be perfectly honest and to state the obvious, a lot of them are Muslim. Uh, a lot of problems are originating from that part of the world. And we want to make sure that people understand that we don't have anything about mu anything against Muslims. We have something against Muslims who want to do violence in Canada and abroad. So I think it's important for us to try and explain what we do and what we don't do. We're not a police agency. We don't go out trying to arrest people. What we want is information about people who want to do harm. I'm not sure there's anything inherently bad about this. What we worry about is people develop these sort of images of, you know, we're going out there and, you know, uh, I think people watch TV too much and they get these images of, you know, secret agents in the night grabbing people and taking them away. We don't do that. We're not that kind of agency. What we do is we try and talk to people. And if they don't understand what we do and how we do it, they won't talk to us. Uh, when you meet, meet with uh, your equals in, in other agencies around the world, there's always a bit of one-upmanship. What is what are you really particularly proud of CSIS for? Well, what does CSIS do really well uh, that you say we're as good as any at this this particular game? I think it's hard to compare apples and oranges because it's an issue of size as well. I think we've done well in keeping up our our work on the counter espionage side. We've done that, I think, more than some of our colleagues. The other area where we've been able to make some progress is we're not A, the United States, which is in a particular category, but we're also not a former colonial power. So there were parts of the world where we can go in with a little bit less baggage, and we've tried very hard to develop the capacity to do that. Um, and I think equally in Canada, we've developed, I think, a 
pretty effective um, way of dealing with these communities that we were talking about. But mostly, I think, it's um, being able to deal in parts of the world where we don't have a lot of baggage and on counter-espionage. Why are CSIS agents so loyal and stay so long? I think it's because the work they do really is quite interesting, uh, and I think most of us would agree that it's pretty important. Uh, we try very hard to be a good employer. We're, we're in the list of the top 100 employers in Canada. Um, on the other hand, some of the work that we do is a bit dangerous, so we try and compensate for that. It's exciting at one level. There's international staff, there's domestic staff, uh, there are operational things, there are policy issues, so you can do a bit of everything in your career. Um, but I think mostly it's because people think it's an important job, and in a strange sort of way, it's sexy. You know, you're going out there doing things that not many other people are able to do. This kind of building is unusual. How did you bag such a nice government building? This was far be far before my time, uh, but I, th I don't think there's a rule anywhere that says that government buildings have to look like shoeboxes. I think if you plan a building in advance, you can actually construct a building that has character without costing the taxpayer any money. And my understanding is that's what they tried to do here. It's an interesting personality, this building, my last question, because it has a kind of open, airy feel to it, which is exactly the reverse of what one would expect coming into CSC's headquarters. I think that's true, and I think it reflects to some degree the schizophrenia that we have. We are really, in many ways, an organization that look, looks inward. On the other hand, if we don't inform government, if we don't know what's important by talking to people around us, we won't be able to do our job. So yes, we have to protect how we do things, but if we don't tell the government the outcomes of our work, if we don't talk about how we do things, or what we do with the public, we're not going to be effective. So we really have to be two things at once.